and organizational and personal stressors. So uh, uh, she is basically the psychologist of the group. Did I get that right? Okay. We also have John Dodge, professor of the School of Commerce and Administration, Laurentian University, uh, partner of the management consulting firm, and uh, um, he uh, usually talks on e-commerce and organizational strategy issues. We also have uh, Steve Mutsatsos. Uh, he uh, is a uh, partner with a law firm, so he's the lawyer in the group. And uh, he has practiced commercial law with IT, in the IT field for the last 12 years, acting counsel to both multinational technology companies and various small software startups. So, uh, and Steve is also affiliated with Laurentian University. What these three have done is a three-year study of uh, hackers and uh, uh, whether they get a bum rap. And uh, I think you will all be pleased with their results. So uh, here they are. Um, thank you very much. Hacking of America, and as it's also titled in the, uh, in the uh, thing that was put out by DevCon is should organizations employ hackers? And we, we think that these th are related because the, um, the we, um, maybe I should give you a little bit of background, is that we are both, both Bernie and I are academics. We've undertaken a, a, a study that we have funded through a very small research budget of our own. It's, uh, the university gives us a bit of money and we, we, we can commit it to whatever project we want without their interference. So we decided to go ahead and do this. So, and we've also dipped into our pockets a little bit to cover additional costs because we did not want to seek outside financing or to seek proposals. So the, the research that we've done has been, been completely independent. You may not or may like the results. It, it, it's very defensible and we think very independent. I just want to get that very clear in the initial stages. Um, we, uh, Bernie and I, worked together at Laurentian University in the School of Commerce, and now Bernie has gone on to be dean at a new university in Toronto. And she's uh, we sort of a loser there, but she's uh, we're very happy to work with her on this project. The the thing that we've found here is that we were funded, we were interested in a, in the research area, and that we really were helped by a number of students, and particularly. Uh, uh, Kevin Ellis and uh, Yana Lahaki that were really uh, instrumental in helping us collect some of the data. We came to uh, H2K two years ago in DevCon, and we uh, had a booth set up in the vendors area where people came around and, and actually committed quite a bit of time, at least a half an hour, to fill out self-reporting questionnaires. It's, uh, so we think it's uh, it, it's quite reasonable to... to um, to present you with some of the data and some of the background material that we found. So moving on, I'll ask uh, Bernie to go to the next slide. <clears throat> One of the motivations of this study is that there's a lot of um, myths out there in the community and society in general. Uh, hackers, for the most part, criminals that should be feared, or are they feared? And of course, that they are feared some ways by society. Um, the question is, are we terrorists? Are we, if we're, as a hacker, are they considered like terrorists? In fact, some people would classify hackers in the same group, um, fearing some kind of internet Chernobyl um, or some other catastrophic event. Um, the other thing is that uh, we, we, if we give, gave hackers clinically derived psychological inventories, what would their answers be, S say about their dangerousness? So we wanted to actually find out how dangerous are hackers. We enough of the mess, so we said let's move on from the mess and try to find out the reality check. Um, we define hackers in this case as persons who spent uh, who over time have enjoyed learning the details of computer systems and how to stretch their capabilities as well as those who have and a number of items that I'm sure you're familiar with gained unauthorized access to computers and uh, and so on. I don't think it's worthwhile to dwell on what a hacker is here. The instrument used was a 22-page uh, questionnaire. It had five parts in it. The five parts were, the uh, first part was on demo, uh, hacker demographics, basically sex, age, income levels, all of that uh, kind of thing. 
Uh, one tidbit that you would uh, like to hear, maybe that's not included in our speech, that uh, hackers are well above the median income for those employed, a very successful financial group in general. Um, the hackers, uh, the second part was on uh, short-term issues of mind-body symptoms. Sometimes you might be under certain kind of stressors um, and that your body's reacting to that stress. And we wanted to verify what, uh, what amount was, uh, how those were linked, and that's short-term. The other three parts were really long-term uh, uh, personality issues here. The, th the first one relates to routine behaviors, and, how, and that reflects some of your personality. Uh, your likes and dislikes, and we used um, well-recognized and accepted um, instruments for these. The third one was uh, uh, um, was uh, used uh, was Rose uh, Leadership Style Index. We wanted to compare you to to uh, business um, people and how they manage, and so the, you know, how do you solve problems, and are they related to business managers? So we wanted to compare you to business manager set. So item four was really personality issues relating to how you manage people and or businesses. When you do research, you've got to go back and say what's been written so far and what, what other research has been done. The, the best comparison base that we can find was done by Shaw, Post, and, and Ruby in 1999. And it was a study of convicted hackers that were working on the inside of organizations. This was a forensic study uh, that basically went back and tracked the issue afterwards. Rather interesting is I thought they, I thought they came up with some very good results. They didn't talk to any of the hackers themselves. This all came from evidence given a trial and other aspects, so one has to weigh it uh, on the sources of that. Um, what they did find is that uh, they said that they're introverted, more comfortable in, a, in um, their own mental world, in a more emotional and non-predictable social world. They have a history of significant family problems. Uh, these are the convicted inside hackers, especially in early childhood, leaving them with negative attitudes towards authority. Uh, so you can see that can happen. And have online computer dependency that interferes or replaces social interactions in adulthood, basically spending a, maybe a little too much time on the computer. Um, more about the insiders, they have an ethical flexibility that allows them to justify any violation. Uh, that's rather typical. Have a strong loyalty to their computer specialty. In fact, far more to their computer specialty than to their employers. And have, and this you've got to remember is was done in the context of an inside convicted hacker, and so they would obviously violate that. Have a, they also have a sense of entitlement, thinking that they are special and are owned recognition, privileges, or exemptions to normative rules uh, governing other employees. Basically, they should have special rules attached to them. We're not saying these are correct. All we're saying is this was what the re best research we had to date to deal with, so we used that as our benchmark, as our comparison. Are these really true and can be verified? So we went on from there. Um, the other one, of course, is they, uh, they lack empathy towards work. Uh, to others at work, uh, generally indicating that the social uh, human resource skills are not uh, is particularly strong. Um, just a quick brief uh, profile here in our study. We had 216 participants in this study. Um, they got 39% uh, were from H2K and 61% were from the DEF CON 8 audience. Overall, 91% were male, obviously 9% female. Uh, the age ranged from 14 years to 61, the mode was 24 years, the median was 25, mean 27, so you have a, a younger come in, a younger age group, um, and then uh, it was skewed to, obviously 14 to 61, it was skewed to the, uh, the younger half of that distribution. Formal education, a mean score of 5, what it really meant was indicating they had probably one to three years of college, business admin or trade school, or, or a, a four-year college program. So there was pretty good um, educational uh, levels achieved. Um, the other issue was that the, that, um, just to go back a bit. Yeah, you can do it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just go ahead now. You 
notice that we're using a Corel product. We just try to keep away from Microsoft. We know we all love, learn to love and hate. <laughs> Blame it on Bernie, eh? Um, the uh, sample contained those charged with hacker relating crimes. It was 9% were charged with hacker relating crimes out of the uh, 216. And of those that served sentences uh, for such was 32%. So basically, a third of those charged uh, uh, were uh, actually served time. Uh, the sample also was rather interesting, contained 18% uh, had crimes of another nature, non-hacking related, and they served sentences 48%. So it's rather interesting, the conviction rate was higher on the non-hacking than the hacking, but it also reflects the fact that uh, they had more other activities going on that uh, brushed with the law. Um, the male hackers tended to be employed by larger companies, uh, so they're not really large companies. They had about 4,200 employees. Um, the hackers uh, charged, the hackers charged of hacking related crimes tended to work in small companies, probably about 56 employees. So it's rather interesting that the, uh, with larger companies, they probably had more sophisticated human resource um, selection processes and, and people in human resource areas may not have wanted to take a risk on a hacker and immediately admitted, a, 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 a re, re, removed that from the list. But this is including everybody that was charged and not charged, by the way. The female hackers tended to work in, in smaller companies of about 1,400 employees. And uh, I think now we move on to the psychological aspects of the hacker, and I'll turn that over to Dr. Bernie Shaw here. Bernie? Hi, thanks a lot, John. Uh, at any point in time, if you don't understand um, some of the terms I use, just raise your hand and I'll try to explain more fully. And uh, of course, uh, in our book, we uh, go through chapters and chapters explaining what each of these psychological items is all about. We'll start uh, at the very beginning, again, uh, going back to the research of Eric Shaw and his colleagues. Uh, a reported um, early childhood traumatic series of events, uh, and uh, when we asked the 216 people uh, in our sample if they had experienced uh, significant childhood trauma, such as loss of a parent through divorce or death, uh, the loss of a sibling, uh, abuse of one form or another. Uh, almost a third of the respondents said that they had experienced uh, those sorts of uh, traumatic events in early years. Uh, probably of more importance to us, um, not just the percentage of respondents who uh, came forward uh, talking about these painful events, but the uh, important assertion that over 60% of those who had experienced such events uh, said that they had uh, long-term negative impacts on their thoughts and behaviors. And so we wanted to look more closely at the data to find out um, what exactly they were suggesting those long-term impacts were. Um, in terms of gender differences, uh, female hackers in particular were more likely to admit experiencing childhood trauma. By what we found, John and I, when we did face-to-face -face interviews at, at H2K, uh, that once we got people to trust us um, with the interviews, well, they would not you know, initially admit that they had some traumatic events. Later on, uh, they would talk about what had happened to them. I'm sorry? Uh, these reported rates of um, trauma in early childhood exceed the norm. Okay, now we were also curious about the reporting of childhood trauma for those who had been charged versus those who had not been charged and for the younger versus older, and we didn't find any significant differences. We then move on to how the respondents said they were able to cope with distress. 
uh, over a, a two-week period um, just before they um, completed the inventory. And we used the symptom checklist that was developed by Derek Gaddis and, and his colleagues in 1974. And um, the scale that we used was a zero to three scale. Zero meant that uh, over this two-week period, uh, individuals weren't experiencing uh, the usual symptoms of stress like nausea, difficulty concentrating, that sort of thing. And uh, at the higher end, two or three meant that they were experiencing extreme bouts uh, and extreme intensity. So what you have here for the 216 respondents, um, mean scores on various clusters of uh, stress symptomology. And the strongest uh, short-term measure uh, in terms of clustering was around anger. Uh, for the uh, hackers, followed by interpersonal sensitivity and a fear of being rejected by uh, their spouses and friends who are close to them, followed by obsessive compulsiveness, which is the need to be perfect, and then we have somatization um, that basically is mind-body disorder. So I might ask you, are you feeling stressed out today? And you might say, no, Bernie, I'm not. And then I'll say, well, uh, have you ex been experiencing any sorts of health issues? And you might say, well, you know, when I think about it, my migraines have been worse the past couple of weeks. My arthritis has flared. My asthma is worse. These are all indicators of uh, somatic outbursts of distress so that you may not verbally think or report that you're distressed, but your body says otherwise. And finally, we have anxiety, just you know, having this need to run away and to, um, to avoid what's going on in the world. Okay, uh, now again, we were curious about that long-term impact of trauma on individuals. And what we found over and over again as we worked through the analyses, that the hacker community um, really uh, fears that uh, they are going to lose their friends. They have difficulty with um, interpersonal relationships and they have a hard time processing interpersonal misunderstandings. And in fact, we found that the strongest correlation with anger was this interpersonal sensitivity item. Uh, there was a gender difference here in terms of distress in the short term with women reporting significantly higher anxiety and somatization stress symptoms than their male counterparts. We then get into uh, the under age 30 hackers versus the, the older uh, over 30 hackers and the younger people were reporting significantly higher anxiety and depression. Uh, and um, I, I might add to a point that we would suggest that they were suffering from clinical depression. We then went on to look at um, the degree of computer addiction that allegedly exists within this population. And we used as a basis Dr. Kimberly Young's research. Um, basically what she said is we, we know that we have someone who's online addicted when they spend over 30 hours online. And uh, what we found for hackers uh, that they reported spending on average 24.45 hours online, which does not qualify them, at least with this indicator, for computer addiction. Per week, yes. Again, Dr. Young went on to say that um, if you are computer addicted, uh, you will have a disrupted sleep cycle, and uh, namely that you get fewer than six hours of sleep per cycle. And what we found was that our hackers didn't report that problem uh, overall, but in fact they were getting on average 6.26 hours of sleep. The under age 30 group, however, uh, did appear to be the most addicted to their computers. Um, they did report engaging in hacking sessions lasting over eight hours, and um, they did report uh, spending over 30 hours per week on online. We then looked at various personality indicators um, 
I had addressed these same indicators and corporate leaders and wrote about that in management in the mirror book. I also looked at these uh, predispositions in um, stalkers and I wrote about those predispositions in a stalking book. And now we, we come to uh, the hacking population and how they see themselves, their long-term routine behaviors over time. And uh, the highest score that you could get on any one of these personality indicators is 10. Any score five or higher we consider to be a significant uh, predisposition in the individual's personality types. And what we found is contrary to the myth uh, that hackers or the hacking community seem to be other destructive, we found that the majority, the, the number one trait was that hackers are self-healing. What we call self-healing type fours. They're balanced actually. Um, on their task needs and on their, their people-related needs. And that keeps them going over time just like the Energizer battery. Funny. <laughs> then the next interesting point, the indicator that was over five uh, for the uh, hacking population was what we call the cancer-prone type five predisposition. This is what we would call a, a noise-in or a noise-denying uh, lifestyle and in fact um, it, it became clear to me that uh, some of that trauma that was experienced in early childhood um, was repressed and um, the style that these children uh, I guess uh, adopted in, in childhood to cope with what was going on in the home environment around them uh, traveled with them into adulthood now, the um, long-term prognosis is that uh, the, the longer one stays in a state of noise denial rather than working through whatever is bothering you constructively uh, puts you at risk for developing cancer. Um, just below the five level was another what we call uh, the uh, harmony desiring cancer-prone type 1 predisposition. So what we have here strong self-healing followed by noise in and a, a cancer-prone prognosis over the long term. We were interested in looking at the psychopathic prone uh, predisposition and uh, what we call the type 3, considerably below the level 5. <clears throat> so typically we, we wouldn't even work at, uh, worry about this for a, a population if the, uh, the mean score is this far below 5. Uh, contrary, again, to what Dr. Kimberly um, Young says, that, that hackers are these uh, computer-addicted, uh, cardiovascular-prone type A, or what we call type 2 types in this instrument, we just didn't find much evidence of that at all. And um, probably of more recent interest to the governments around the world since September 11th, as well as to researchers, what about um, the terrorist prone, obsessive, narcissistic type six predisposition and what we found for the majority, extremely low. So our summary then, taken as a composite, uh, these hacker study findings for the sample size of 216 seem to support the assertions of two sets of academics in particular, Shotton from 1991 and Kagan and Duhat from 1985, um, which seem to indicate that the hackers were more uh, well-balanced in nature, and our findings certainly uh, did not support to any large degree the assertions of Dr. Young. Bottom line then, that the hackers attending the H2K and DevCon 8 conventions seem to have relatively relaxed and balanced temperaments rather than type A or type 2 task obsessed ones. We did, I admit, uh, find a, a segment that seemed to suffer more and that again was the underage 30 hackers who had significantly higher type A scores, uh, those again are the cardiovascular prone. Uh, scores compared to their age uh, 30 and over counterparts. They also had significantly higher narcissistic uh, psychopathic prone type 3 scores 
And they also had higher antisocial type 6 scores, um, again, compared to their older counterparts. However, and I put this in bold, all of these red flag scores were below a critical level of 5. We then went on to assess uh, the hackers' creativity levels. And um, Dubrin in 1995 created a test which we utilized, the self-report test. The maximum score that anybody could get on that is 20. And the group of 216 respondents received a high mean score of 15.30. Uh, the cutoff point is 15, indicating extremely high creative potential. And in fact, for these respondents, the median was 16, the mode was 17, and 62% uh, of the respondents actually had scores meeting or exceeding this critical level of 15. We then get into decision-making styles, and I'll uh, let John speak to this. Um, this is a decision-making style uh, used by Roe and his colleagues, and it's over, I think there's over 100,000 people in business that uh, this test has been applied to. And what you do is you have four management styles. You have an analytical type style, a conceptual style, a directive style, and a behavioral style. An analytic is very obviously uh, looks for information, uh, crunches it down in an analytical way. Conceptual is looking at a broad spectrum of things, and somebody that can do detail may not look at the broad spectrum. And the other one is directive, very firm, directive style, do this, do that style. And the behavioral style would be a highly uh, organizational, HR kind of uh, touchy-feely style to, be, to make it very simple. Um, very simply is that the hackers are cognitively complex and creative in their thinking meaning they tend to have the analytical and conceptual mix. Rather interestingly enough is this is the mix that you'll tend to see in CEOs and presidents at that high level. Uh, what was rather interesting looking at the mean behavioral style is that the, uh, the group as a whole were lower, meaning you probably wouldn't make a good group of human resource managers. Um, so there's no surprise to that, I'm sure, as well. Um, moving on, I'll uh, hand, now hand it over to Steve and we'll take a look at some of the legal implications of our study. Thanks, John. Uh, uh, the, this presentation will focus uh, more on the economic, social, and uh, political context of anti-hacking laws as opposed to uh, black letter law. One, I'm, I'm not a U.S. lawyer, and two, the anti-hacking laws are changing by the day. So I think in, in order to put this into a, a better context, it's, it's more important for us to understand what's um, shaping and motivating these laws. And although it's no longer fashionable to um, uh, cast debates in an ideological context since the end of the Cold War, I think in order to properly um, uh, understand this debate, you have to look at it from uh, uh, an ideological perspective. Uh, and to that extent, what we see here is that the uh, criminalization of whitehead hacking represents a struggle between two competing uh, paradigms over the control of information and knowledge. Um, on the one hand, uh, there exists what we'll refer to as the property rights or property paradigm. Uh, and that contains certain fundamental tenets of our society uh, that uh, private property rights deserve the protection of the law, to paint a very broad brush. Uh, as in most industrialized uh, nations, moving to a post-industrial uh, phase, information technology is becoming more important, and the protection of intangible property rights uh, and their security uh, of electronic infrastructures is critical. Now, the proponents of the property rights uh, paradigm are ourselves. In many instances, it's individuals trying to protect uh, artistic creations, uh, their privacy. Uh, but it's also uh, institutions like government and corporations concerned about national security, uh, security of infrastructure, or the security of e-commerce transactions, for example. In, in terms of who's driving the uh, property rights uh, or property paradigm agenda, it's per it's primarily corporations and state entities that have taken the lead in advancing uh, the property rights paradigm. 
and we see that in, in criminal prosecutions uh, that, that you're all familiar with, and as well increasingly now in the civil action uh, context, uh, one example would be the Napster litigation. Now from the uh, competing perspective or competing ideology, what we have is what we call the hacker paradigm, which really encapsulates this idea that there should be a free flow of information. Uh, the hacker paradigm itself has a sound, very sound ideological base. It's a fundamental tenet of our society as well, uh, that in order to advance uh, knowledge, uh, information should be shared. And I think it could be argued that it, it, it may have even uh, a stronger base. Uh, examples of this would be the uh, recent announcement by MIT to uh, have open courseware and the um, manifestation of, of, of the hacker paradigm uh, arguably is in the hacker attack itself. Now, in order to try to understand uh, what's happening in the legal context, uh, we try to try to look for some analogies, and these are not analogies that you know we've necessarily come up with. I mean, people talk about it all the time. Uh, the electronic frontier. And the electronic frontier has a lot in common with uh, the old, I guess, frontier being the Wild West. Uh, we're here in Las Vegas, which is quite uh, fitting, I suppose. And the parallels with the Old West uh, are very striking, uh, both from a practical level and a legal level. Uh, what you have is you have new technologies allowing communications, travel, work, exploration. Uh, in the old day, West, it was the railroad, now it's the internet. You have huge fortunes being made, uh, innovation risk taking and being rewarded on a scale previously unimaginable. People and technology finds itself ahead of the law. Uh, the frontier attacks, attracts all sorts of people, good people, bad people, the ugly. Uh, and monopolies are created, uh, antitrust challenges uh, result. So the results is what we characterize as a disorder to order equilibrium. And as the frontier becomes increasingly disorderly, uh, and as in the frontier, in the Old West, there was that there's you know, a lot of good real estate resources, uh, and the value of the electronic frontier is obvious. The need, there is a need to bring impetus uh, for the state is to create blunt instruments of justice. And you get the common notion of what we call frontier justice. And this need to make, um, importantly, there's a scramble to establish new laws and law enforcement agencies to deal with these issues. Now, in order to assess the reasonableness of, of any law difficult, um, and I think that's the case with the electronic frontier. Uh, I think most uh, observers would argue that there's probably been an overreaction in terms of the legal response. And, I, and we, we're going to look at what the drivers are that for. Are Basically, uh, we perceive the three main drivers for anti-hacking laws, one being national well-being, which is obvious, uh, secure, uh, electronic infrastructure is critical to the um, health of um, our economy and our society. Uh, the second driver would be a lack of understanding. For the most part, I think lawmakers, uh, law enforcement, uh, although they have an understanding, probably don't understand uh, this area nearly as well as perhaps you do, uh, or maybe none of us really understand exactly what we're dealing with. And the third driver, which uh, derives from lack of understanding, is fear. And this essentially drives this, um, this overreaction. And as a result, you have the criminalization of many uh, white hat hacking activities. Now, uh, oh, it's OK. Uh, you took away my thunder, Bernie. Uh, but I was burning the, the slides that basically no justice without knowledge. And part of the, the concept of, of justice, in order to have uh, an informed debate about what law is reasonable, uh, people, society, lawmakers have to have a very clear uh, and unfettered understanding of what the issues are. And, you know, we see this in debates that are occurring in our society where the issues are fairly clearly understood, legalization of marijuana, abortion, capital punishment. These are issues which most people understand. And even there, we have a real difficulty in striking a fair balance. So in a situation uh, like hacking, unfortunately, there's not this clear understanding that people are being motivated in many instances by fear. 
So uh, our hope is by uh, undertaking this study that we'll be able to shed some light uh, on, on the hacker community, in particular the differences between the white hats and the black hats, and this will, should, uh, we hope, uh, influence um, lawmakers and law enforcement uh, in a positive direction. Uh, Bernie, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, so our bottom line uh, that you will be seeing if you uh, read a book is that hackers are getting a bad rap. Uh, and that's unfortunate because society does covet hacker skills. Um, that you have a lot of the talent that we seek in industry today. Or I guess in recent weeks, the accountants have been taking a, a, a tough rap themselves. Um, we go into detail in the book about is the vilification of the hacker community justified? We have a book filled with all sorts of cases, um, colleagues of, of yours, I'm sure that you're familiar with, who've uh, given us details uh, to share, and then we, we have analyses of those details and try to relate those analyses to our data. And um, we address uh, in the book, this key question, should organizations employ hackers? And um, well, I guess if we told you our, our answer to that, you'd never buy the book. <laughs> um, now, I must say that uh, we had fully intended to launch our book here, as John had mentioned earlier, at uh, DevCon 10. And in fact, if it weren't for uh, Bernie S., uh, and uh, Dark Tangent, um, we never would have gotten as far in our data collection as we had. And um, we complained to our publisher that uh, we really wanted to launch the book here at DevContent. What could they do to help those of you who might be interested? And so they've agreed uh, to give a 20% discount to anyone attending here, and uh, we have uh, hundreds of sheets to distribute to you if, if you have interest in what it is we have to say. Uh, and I guess that pretty well is our presentation for today. I know our time is up. If you have any particular questions that you'd like to ask us, please feel free to come up. And um, I'm going to turn the mic over to John. Any particular questions or anything? Yeah. Hacking, uh, the book title is The Hacking of America, Who's Doing It, Why, and How. Yes, so we do speak um, to a large degree about the differences. We looked at younger versus older those charged of hacking related crimes versus not and then gender differences. I'm now doing a study on um, women in IT. So this is the, the next path that I'm walking down. To. Anything else? Go ahead. The question was, is, is are there any studies of non-U.S. hackers? And in fact, this study could be considered international. We, uh, we actually had uh, respondents from Canada, from uh, most of the European countries. Um, so it's, it's, and we found nothing significantly different between the groups that we interviewed anyway for the sample size that we started with. Um, anything to add to that? Any other questions? There's one over here and then one over there. Uh, I'm not sure if I heard the question properly, but I, the question is, is it's a self-reporting survey and whether it represents the total group? Is that, uh, um, there's always a question in research whether you're representing the population. Um, we had people volunteer from two separate groups and they filled it out and they spent a significant amount of time, a half hour, filling out if anybody here did that. It's, it's, it's not an easy questionnaire to do. We had uh, people that, uh, so it, we think it fairly represents um, the group that, that filled out the questionnaire. 
uh, and we that's the best available information that you can apply against the population. And I, but uh, until some other data collection management can be can be done, there was another question I believe over here, and then we'll move over. No. I didn't think so. And there was another question here, wasn't? Oh, here, yes. Question is, is is I, I believe relates to is 216 adequate enough to give a valid response? I think that generally those that are on the statistical side, that generally you, you get your errors down reasonably on these kinds of instruments that are well tested if they're if they're anywhere over 100. So probably 200 is not a bad sample size. We allowed it to be quite open. We would have been happy to get more. Um, it took a while to administer the study, and so it's. It's, um, and it was detailed. We might take slices of it again and, and, and make it simpler and get a wider, wider distribution, but this was a very detailed questionnaire. And of course, people are reluctant to take the time to fill it out. So. I believe the question was, would, you, would the results have been different or better if you had observed people operating a computer than from filling out a questionnaire? Is that correct? Or interviewed them in the process of when they were on the computer? I think that um, what I was doing when I, I held the interview uh, with people is I made my observations at that point in time. Uh, and John did as well. Uh, and I, I don't have any reason to believe that um, people were faking the responses. And I mean, we certainly have ways of looking for that in the data. And uh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I guess the, the question was, is that it, it, would, they, would they show different personality traits while they're on the computer than when they're off the computer? We don't know because we didn't do it. <laughs> I don't have any uh, indicators to suggest that that's the case. That's a wonderful thing about research. It, it never ended, you know, it's academic pursuits. Is there a question from the back there, I guess? Yes? 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 And there was a question of the, of the uh, rules we used for online addiction, I guess, whether it related to the number of hours and whether it was online at work as well as on ours. And uh, I'll turn that over to Bernie to, I think it was Young's. Yeah, no, it, it really uh, doesn't matter, okay. Um, Young doesn't make that distinction. Although the way we asked the question, the survey, we were able to, uh, to, to tease out um, whether people were answering strictly, you know, as a off, um, employment uh, point of view or on the job as well. So we had a series of questions, I guess what I'm trying to say, that got at that issue. And uh, in the book, we, we comment that uh, computer addiction from several different angles. Any additional questions? Thank you very much, and um, I'm glad to be here again. <laughs>